Well, this morning we want to continue to count the cost of sin. And that may not actually be entirely true. We probably don't want to count the cost of sin. Actually, I think, in fact, most of us would much rather not talk about sin at all. Uh, talking about sin is unpleasant. It's depressing. It's discouraging. But it is also necessary. You know, to ignore the topic of sin is to ignore the reality of the world in which we live. Uh, as we talked about last week, uh, sin and its consequences are unavoidable. You know, we've all experienced uh, the, the shame and the guilt and the fear that comes when we do wrong. Uh, we know what it's like to have broken relationships. We know what it's like to go through the, the pain and the struggle of this life. You know, that's the reality that we all experience. But of course, that's not the reality that God intended for us to experience. Uh, we were reminded last week that the world that God created was very good. As John MacArthur put it, he said, When God completed his perfect creation, it was very good because there was no disorder, there was no chaos, there was no conflict, there was no struggle, there was no pain, there was no discord, there was no disease, there was no decline, there was no death. You know, that's the very good world that God created, a world free from all that junk. But that's sure not the world that we find ourselves in today. Sin has twisted and tainted God's good creation, and we all suffer the consequences for it. You know, we suffer because of sin in the world, and we suffer because of sin in our own lives. Uh, we mentioned last, uh, two weeks ago, I guess it was, how, how the Bible describes us as being slaves to sin. We're, we're born with that that those selfish, uh, selfish inclinations. And as a result, much of the, the shame and the guilt and the fear and the broken relationships and the pain and the suffering that we experience in this life, much of that we bring upon ourselves. And then not all of it, of course, but certainly a lot of it uh, because we, we act selfishly and we fail to love one another. We fail to love God. Uh, we fail to be that reflection of God's image as God created us to be. And so as a result, we, we suffer the consequences of our own sinfulness. And we talked quite a bit about those consequences last week. Um, and, and particularly, uh, I wanted to dig into that a little bit more today uh, in the consequence of death. Uh, and again, I know that's, that's not a real uplifting talk, topic to talk about, uh, but that's still the reality that we face. And so it's important that we do. Uh, we read from Romans 6, 23 last week, which says, For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so we're going to continue to count the cost of sin today, or as this verse puts it, the wages of sin, which is death. Uh, but don't worry, we're also going to look at the, the second part of that verse that talks about how the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. We're going to see how Jesus came to right the wrongs, how he came to restore God's good creation and to free us from the slavery of sin and to give us life. So we're going to just pause right here for a second. We're going to pray and just ask God to, to teach us and, and to encourage us from his word this morning. Dear God, we thank you that we can uh, gather together today. We can open up your word and, and we, can, we can read it out loud in this public forum and we can try to learn what you've taught us uh, in this book. Uh, we pray that our, our ears would be attentive to what, you know, what I say necessarily, but what you have to say through your word. We pray that our hearts would be open to receive the, the, the information, the, the challenge that you give us today. Uh, so God, pray that uh, you would guide my words, guide our ears, and that you would speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So now this week, I want us to begin in the beginning, as we did last week. Uh, not only was the Garden of Eden the, the location of the origin of life, but it was also the location of the origin of death. Uh, the very first mention of death is actually in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, where God warns the very first man, Adam, uh, of the consequences of eating the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and I'll just back up to verse 15 just to kind of give you the context. It says, The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, You may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. All right, now this shouldn't be a, a confusing uh, statement here, not a confusing passage. It seems pretty clear from these verses that eating the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil would lead to death, right? God told Adam right off the bat that if you eat from this tree of this fruit, you are sure to die, right? That seems very, very plain and straightforward, right? But here's the thing, when we get to the next chapter and we see Adam and Eve doing exactly what God told them not to do, and they're eating the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you know, we kind of expect to read something like, you know, Adam and Eve took one bite of the fruit and they immediately fell over dead. All right, that's kind of what we'd expect to read based on God's warning here in verse 17. 
But of course, that's not what we read in chapter 3. Uh, we read through that last week, and, and we went through almost the entire chapter. And uh, there was certainly many consequences that came with sin, but we didn't read anything about Adam and Eve, you know, clutching their throats, gasping in their last breath, and, and falling over to the ground dead. That, that's not in there at all. In fact, if you keep reading, you go down to uh, chapter 5 of Genesis. In verse 3, we read this. It says, when Adam was 130 years old, he became the father of a son who was just like him in his very image. He named his son Seth. After the birth of Seth, Adam lived another 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. So what's the deal here? I mean, was God just bluffing about this whole death thing? You know, why do we not see Adam and Eve keel over dead when they ate the fruit that God said is going to cause their deaths? Well, first of all, I'll point out that for the sake of making this point, uh, I conveniently left out verse 5 from this passage, uh, which follows what we just read, and I'll read it here. It says, Adam lived 930 years, and then he died. All right, so we do see Adam keel over and die, albeit not for a very long time after the fact. And to us, you know, for Adam to live 930 years and then die, you know, that, that hardly seems like a consequence. That seems more like a miraculous blessing, right? But we, we forget that had Adam not sinned, he would never have had to face death at all, right? From what the Bible indicates, you know, Adam could have lived forever without sin. So the timing of Adam's death isn't really the issue. The issue is more the fact of Adam's death. You know, God said that Adam would die if he ate the fruit, and indeed, that is exactly what happened. But I think there's more to God's warning about death to Adam here as the consequence of sin than just Adam's body giving out 930 years down the road. You know, I think that's certainly part of it, but I think the consequences of death uh, reach even beyond that. Um, our dictionaries today define death as the end of one's life, right? It's, it's a termination, it's, it's the conclusion, right? Uh, but that's not really an accurate understanding of death. In the Bible, death is never seen as the end of someone. Uh, death is always seen as separation. Uh, specifically, death is the separation of soul and body, right? When your body ceases to function, your, your soul separates from it, right? Your soul doesn't end, it doesn't cease to exist. It's just no longer connected to your body. Uh, that's, that's death. That's uh, separation when your, your soul separates from your body. Uh, and we see this idea throughout the scriptures. And I'll just give you a couple of quick examples. In Genesis chapter 25, verse 17, we read about Ishmael. Uh, and it says, Ishmael lived a total of 137 years. He breathed his last and died. Then he joined his ancestors. Now, isn't it interesting how they phrase that? He died... And then he joined his ancestors. And you certainly don't get the idea that, that Ishmael ceased to exist, right? Uh, but rather, his soul separated from his body, and then his soul went on to join those, uh, those other souls that had died before him. Uh, Solomon says in, in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 6, he says, Yes, remember your creator now, while you were young, before the silver cord of life snaps and the golden bowl is broken. Don't wait until the water jar is smashed at the spring and the pulley is broken at the well, for then the dust will return to the earth and the spirit will return to God who gave it. All right, now there's a lot of poetic imagery in there, but in essence, Solomon is saying, remember your creator now while you are young before you get old and die. Because when you die, your soul will be separated from your body. Your body will return to the dust from which God created man in the first place, and your spirit or your soul will return to God. So you can kind of see how in the Bible, death is never seen as termination, but rather as separation. And this is true even outside of physical death. The idea of death isn't just reserved for the separation of soul and body, but it can also be used to describe even the separation of two people. Uh, for example, in the story of the prodigal son, Right, we see this, this rebellious young man, he, he demands an early inheritance, and he gets it from his father, and then he, he leaves home. Right, He abandons his family to go to a faraway place and, and live lavishly, and, and he wastes all his money. Famine eventually comes, though, and he's all out of cash, and so he ends up returning home. Um, and of course, his older brother isn't very happy about this, but look what the father says. Uh, in verse 32 of Luke 15, he says, We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. 
Right? Now, now, the father here is clearly not talking about physical death, right? Uh, I don't think the father thought that his son had died and miraculously been resurrected to life, but rather he was dead in the sense that they were separated from one another, and the father didn't even know if they'd ever be reunited again. That father had experienced what seemed like death because there was that sense of, of perhaps permanent separation. And I think that idea, that understanding of death is most certainly an element of the death that God warns Adam against in, in eating this fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, not only would Adam experience that physical death uh, eventually where his soul and body would be separated, but he would also experience separation both from God and from his fellow man. And we talked a little bit about that last week, actually, as we're going through some of the consequences of sin. We talked about how sin caused separation between Adam and Eve as they, they played the blame game, and neither one wanted to uh, take responsibility for their own actions, and their relationship was damaged because of that, and they, they lost that sense of, of unity and togetherness that they once had. Uh, there was that separation there. And then also, uh, their relationship with God was damaged. You'll remember that the first thing they did after they, they sinned is they tried to hide from God, right? So there was a separation there as well. And I think this was all part of God's warning that if they were to sin, they would surely die. Uh, they would experience separation on all kinds of levels. And that's equally true for us as well today. Our sin leads to separation. It separates us from one another, and it separates us from God. Um, you can probably think of all kinds of examples in your own life where either your sin or someone else's sin has caused separation between you two, where it puts up barriers and walls and, and there's that loss of, of connection, of unity, of togetherness. Uh, that's, that's what sin does, right? It's hard to, to trust someone who's lied to you, right? It, it's hard to be close to someone who's hurt you. You know, sin separates us from each other and it creates those barriers and those walls between us. And sin also separates us from God. Uh, Isaiah 59, verse 2 says, It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away and will not listen anymore. And this could be a whole other topic for another day, but God's holiness and his righteousness could not allow sinful people to be in his presence. You know, there, there can't be unity between darkness and light, right? That, that just doesn't work. Our sin separates us from God. And that's why the Bible tells us that we are all dead because of our sins, right? Our soul may currently be still connected to our body, but we are dead because of that separation that we have between us and God. Uh, Paul writes in Ephesians, he says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Now, these guys that Paul's writing to, you know, they weren't physically dead, of course, but they were spiritually dead because they were separated from God by their disobedience and their many sins. Um, and that's actually the state that we're all born into. Uh, we're all born with that sinful nature, as we mentioned, those sinful inclinations that we have. And because of that, we are born separated from God. In essence, we are born dead. And that's why the Bible teaches that we must be born again. You'll remember that Jesus himself said in John 3.3, uh, 3, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So Jesus is saying that unless we can become reconnected with God, you know, unless we can somehow remove that sin that separates us, then we have no hope of being with God. We will remain dead. We will remain separated from him forever. And the Bible teaches that we have this one lifetime, however long that may be, uh, to get reconnected to God, uh, who is the source of our life, right? As we said last week, you know, our physical bodies begin dying from the moment we're born, right? We begin to deteriorate and we begin the journey to, uh, towards death. And there's nothing that we can do to stop that. But God has given us that window of opportunity while our, our body is in the process of dying. We have that opportunity to reconnect to him uh, through Jesus Christ. Uh, in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. So Jesus is the way to life. Uh, he's the way to true life, to eternal life. Faith in Jesus is how we get to be born again. It's how we get reconnected to God. The Apostle John writes this in uh, 1 John 5, verse 11. And this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. And then he says it so very clearly. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. You know, without Jesus, we are quite literally dead men walking, right? We are spiritually dead, and we are physically dying. But with Jesus, 
we become spiritually alive, and we have the assured hope of physical resurrection. And this is why Easter is so significant to us. Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, died on a cross for our sins. He, he experienced the separation of soul and body, as well as the separation of God and man, as he took all of our sins upon himself. Now think about how significant that was for Jesus. I mean, Jesus had spent an eternity past in perfect harmony and unity and togetherness with God the Father, right? There's never, in all eternity past, never a hint of separation between the two. But yet now, as Jesus was dying on the cross, as he took our sin upon himself, he experienced that separation. In uh, Matthew chapter 27, verse 45, it says, At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. At about three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? You know, sometimes you wonder if God understands the, the heartache and, and the loneliness and, and the emptiness that you feel. I can assure you, he does, probably more than, than we have ever experienced. Jesus experienced every aspect of death so that you could experience every aspect of life. Uh, it says in... Uh, Ephesians 2, verse 4, but God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved, for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. In other words, Jesus took our punishment of eternal death, eternal separation from God, and he paid that price for us. You know, on that day, some 2,000 years ago, Jesus defeated sin and he defeated death. Those two things no longer have a hold over us if we've put our trust in Jesus. You now, we can be born again spiritually because we can be reconnected to God now that our sin has been taken away. Um, and we can also be born again physically, so to speak, because God has promised that just as Jesus experienced that physical resurrection from the dead, we too will experience physical resurrection from the dead. I love what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'll start at verse 52. Paul says, it will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it almost sounds crazy to say that, you know, one day you and I, we're going to die, but then we're going to be raised back to life, that, that our souls will rejoin our bodies, but bodies that have been transformed in a way that they will never die again. That, that sounds pretty crazy, but that's exactly what Jesus already did. He died and was raised to life, and his body was transformed, and he will never die again. And this is the core of what we believe as Christians. If, if we're wrong on this, then we're wrong on everything, right? We, made as, we might as well not even be here. Actually, Paul says that very same thing uh, in a little bit earlier in that chapter. In 1 Corinthians 15, 14, he says, If Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless, and your faith is useless. But then he continues just down a little bit further. He says, But in fact... Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there's an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. After that, the end will come, and he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. For Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. 
This next Sunday, we are going to celebrate Easter. We're going to celebrate that Jesus not only died for our sins, but he rose again to new life, new eternal life, the same new eternal life that he has offered to each one of us. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. If you have not accepted that free gift of eternal life, I would encourage you, I would plead with you to consider accepting that free gift even today. We're going to share communion together this morning, uh, but before we do, I'd like us just to take some time to reflect uh, on all that we've talked about this morning. You know, this topic uh, of Christ's victory over death and his offer of eternal life to each one of us, you know, that's, that's a, a topic of infinite significance. You know, your eternity could be determined by a decision that you make here today. Uh, so I'm going to have the music team come up at this point, and they're going to lead us in a song. And, and it's not a Christmas song this time, don't worry. Uh, but it should certainly fill us with joy as we sing about all that Christ has done for us to give us life. And again, if you're not 100% confident that you've accepted that free gift of life, man, come talk to me after the service. I would love to, to continue this conversation with you in person. But let's sing that song together. <laughs> 